Hello, everyone, and, and welcome. My name is Joe Saramelli, and I oversee Grand Rounds for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Thank you for joining today's Grand Rounds uh, presentation. We, we're trying to have a theme for this year's Grand Rounds series called Next Steps in Care, with a series of presentations about next steps in care, innovations in care. Uh, there's a core group of us uh, who work on Grand Rounds each week. Uh, including Samhara Braha on coordination and communications and Mike Walker on technology. We do archive our presentations on the Grand Rounds website, uh, which is through the department website. I want to acknowledge funding for the this year's series from the Ripley Fund and from institutes in the department, including the Garvey Institute for Brain Health Solutions. I'll put a link to a Grand Rounds speaker evaluation into the chat box close to the end of the presentation. I invite you to complete the five question uh, evaluation uh, for today's presentation. Now, uh, for today, uh, today's presenter uh, is Dr. Mark Duncan. Uh, Dr. Duncan is an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at UW. And Dr. Duncan is an expert in addiction psychiatry. Now, interestingly, uh, Dr. Duncan practices in what you might think of as outpatient consultation liaison settings. Uh, such as in primary care. And Dr. Duncan's focus and interests are uh, increasing access to and improving quality of addiction treatment uh, in primary care settings. Now, Dr. Duncan does this in, in three ways. Um, one is through clinical practice, uh, seeing patients directly, working as a psychiatric consultant in collaborative care uh, for patients uh, with addiction. Uh, Dr. Duncan also uh, does this through research uh, such as working as a co-investigator on a, on a very large collaborative care clinical trial called the CHAMP study, and is, is currently actually leading a study uh, on using app-based contingency management uh, for opioid use disorder treatment to try to improve retention and outcomes. Um, and uh, Dr. Duncan uh, aims to improve quality of addiction treatment in primary care through education, and that's educating residents across several departments. It's educating fellows. Uh, who are subspecializing in addiction psychiatry and uh, leading a program called the UW PAC uh, to educate and learn from clinicians across Washington State. And the PAC is, is what a big part of today's presentation is about. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from our colleague, uh, Dr. Duncan, who, who I'll turn it over to now. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joe. I appreciate the invitation to present uh, and talk about the University of Washington Psychiatry and Addiction Case Conference. Uh, and uh, share some of the lessons we've learned along the way. So the University of Washington Psychiatry Addiction Case Conference is also called PAC. And one of the questions we're gonna be looking at is can UW PAC train the existing workforce to help meet the mental health needs of the state? I have uh, no disclosures. Uh, some of the objectives. So I'm going to describe the model that UW PAC is based on. I'm going to review what the evidence says about what the model does well in specific regards to substance use disorder and mental health treatment. I'll describe the impact that UW PAC is having across the state, and then I'll look at ways that UW PAC works with other models like the collaborative care model and um, beyond. Uh, if you do any searching online, it's, you can quickly find that the University of Washington and in particular, the psychiatry uh, department does a lot of uh, community education. Uh, and so how do all these kind of models fit together? And I'll talk briefly about that. So um, I think it's clear if, uh, if you are working in mental health that the mental health needs of Washington state are great. Uh, you look at the drug overdose deaths, uh, they have increased in 2020 by 37 percent. You look at data from 2018 to 2019 uh, out of Kaiser uh, that showed that 44 percent of adults uh, in Washington state with moderate mental health issue, mental health symptoms did not receive treatment, and 37 percent of those with severe mental health issue Ill, illnesses uh, did not receive treatment. If you are in clinical practice right now, uh, this is very clear. Your wait lists are probably much longer and arguably the severity of the patients you are seeing is, uh, has grown. Uh, there's a few different ways that you can think about trying to address uh, this growing need. One is uh, by prevention. Um, 
you know, are there ways to help kind of reduce people from developing substance use disorders or uh, mental health symptoms, uh, making those worse in some way? Uh, you can train new providers and the department has a few different initiatives going there. Uh, you can look at using more <clears throat> efficient models of care, like the collaborative care model uh, that we uh, uh, widely use here across our system. And then finally, you can look at what can you do to train the existing workforce? So some of my background before I uh, went into psychiatry was in uh, family medicine. I did a family medicine residency. Uh, and during my time uh, in that residency, uh, I grew frustrated uh, with the large degree of patients that I was seeing that had mental health and substance use problems. And the uh, just the in adequate training uh, that I was receiving. Now, I went to a great uh, family medicine residency and I was nothing, I take nothing against that. I think this is kind of a broad problem uh, across medicine, which has gotten better, uh, but it's, uh, but, but there's a lot of providers out there who just have not gotten uh, a lot of mental health training, especially to uh, meet some of the more uh, complicated needs that are emerging here. Uh, and this is where I think UW-PAC uh, is really targeted in particular. Now, I'll talk a little bit about who, who comes to PAC, uh, and that does include some trainees, but the bulk of our participants are people in practice already. Uh, and so we're really targeted on that group. So what is UW-PAC? UW-PAC is based on the model uh, called Project ECHO. Uh, this was developed, this stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. It was initially developed in 2003 to help expand treatment of hepatitis C in the state of New Mexico. Uh, in that state, they really saw that once they got, once uh, patients were outside city limits or outside of the territory, uh, kind of the scope of the University of New Mexico, uh, hepatitis C treatment dropped off dramatically and was very hard to get. And so they tried to use, they use this model to address that educational need to help support community providers to provide that treatment. And I'll speak more to that in a couple of minutes. In general, the goal of ECHO programs are to develop the capacity for safe and effective treatments of chronic, common, and complex conditions. And they really try to do that by linking specialty care, often with a uh, university setting like ours, uh, with primary care, or uh, more broadly, uh, community providers, which again, I'll talk about. Since its initial kind of targeting in the hepatitis C, it has grown dramatically into encompassing a number of different areas that go beyond health. I mean, pretty much any, almost any uh, medical specialty has an ECHO program and that includes surgical specialties uh, and cancer and, also, and of course, uh, uh, neurology and all sorts of different areas, infectious diseases, uh, but it includes now civics. And in fact, in Albuquerque, there is a police department training around de-escalation uh, and crisis intervention. Uh, techniques. On the educational side, a lot of pr some programs sprung up around um, during the pandemic to help provide, treat, uh, help teachers learn how to uh, address uh, social and emotional learning of their students uh, during those stressful times. Uh, so it's gone beyond health now into a lot of different areas, and it's grown well beyond the borders of the U.S. Uh, to now include 191 different countries. Uh, based on the University of New Mexico's uh, latest uh, tally on their website from a few days ago, uh, there is over 4,600, just over 4,600 different programs. Nearly 3 million attendees uh, have participated in ECHO program, providing in over 4 million uh, learning hours. So uh, the ECHO program has been widely disseminated, widely developed uh, to really be a leading educational provider and trainer uh, for existing uh, uh, providers uh, that are practicing. Uh, so what does that exactly look like? I'm gonna show you this short video here from the University of uh, New Mexico. Uh, and uh, we'll see how this, uh, and hopefully this will give you a little bit of an idea on how this goes. Uh, so give me one second here. I'm gonna do something uh, just to make sure that I should have, okay. All right, here we go. Project ECHO is a performance optimizer. Think of it as a high-speed internet connection for the healthcare system. It spreads new medical knowledge throughout the healthcare system from university medical centers and other specialty care sites to the front lines of community care. Rather than information flowing in one direction, community providers learn from specialists. They learn from each other, and specialists learn from community providers as new best practices emerge. Under ECHO, community providers use video technology to participate in guided practice with specialist mentors. 
they acquire new skills that allow them to treat patients they otherwise would have referred out. Patients with complex chronic conditions get high quality care where they live from providers they know. No waiting months to see a specialist. No long drives back and forth to get critical care. ECHO exponentially increases access to specialty care by moving knowledge instead of moving patients. Suffering and pain are reduced and lives are improved and even saved. Project ECHO. Changing the world fast. Join us at echo.unm.edu. Are you part of the ECHO? All right, so hopefully that gave you a little bit of a background as far as what the ECHO program is. And I will say, and there is a lot to be said around that ex expediting specialty consultation. Uh, there's lots of ways for providers in Washington State to get that, uh, and PAC is one of those. Uh, we do take cases uh, that pay, that providers can submit uh, either the day of uh, or in the days leading up to any particular session. Now, when we started PAC, we had a few starting assumptions, one of which that we thought there would be interest in this program uh, due to the limited, health, limited mental health resources across the state. Uh, we also um, uh, thought we would really need to target primary care because there's lots, of prim there's lots of mental health treatment that occurs. The bulk of mental health treatment is occurring in primary care. We thought flexibility would be key. You know, if you think about a primary care provider, they're busy and they may not be able to make it to every session. There's different levels of knowledge between provider from pr to provider. And so we wanted to give people the option to kind of drop by when they felt like it was a topic that they really needed uh, to get into uh, or um, and, and not kind of uh, feel like, oh, okay, this, you know, my cohort is done. And so this is no longer a service available to me. Uh, we really try to want to develop a very supportive environment. Uh, when you present clinical cases, if you've ever done that before, uh, it can be a pretty intimidating situation, especially if you're doing it to like a bunch of specialists at an, ac at an academic center like the University of Washington, um, you know, where, uh, you know, you don't want to be criticized for making a wrong decision, all this sorts of stuff. So we really try to be very supportive uh, and make it a place where people are free to ask questions around some of the simplest topics, but also some of the most complex. Uh, arguably, some of the simplest questions that we that come up um, can have a, a more complicated answer than people uh, may think. We thought our didactic time would be brief. Uh, that has not been the case. Uh, there's a lots of interest and great discussion that happens during our didactic time. And we thought that cases would start slow, but grow in numbers. And as I'll point out, uh, that has not been the case, although that's not a unique thing to our program necessarily. Now, from those starting assumptions, we kind of came up with this goal. We wanted to increase patient access across the state uh, to effective and evidence-based psychiatric, psychological, and addiction care through increasing the knowledge and self-efficacy of all interested health providers within an intentionally supportive virtual community. Uh, so there's lots of buzzwords there that I've kind of highlighted, uh, but we really uh, are uh, uh, kind of taking this uh, to heart and, it, and kind of and, uh, is something that flows uh, throughout each of our sessions. So what exactly um, is the, some of the background on the PAC? How does it work? Uh, so we get our funding from the Washington State Legislature uh, through a, uh, we're part of the Integrated Care Training Program funding. Uh, it is free to participate uh, for any provider. CME is available for a small cost. Uh, we target, uh, in particular, Washington State providers, of course, since uh, the state is funding it. It occurs on Thursdays from 12 to 1.30. Uh, we started back in July of 2016, so we're uh, halfway through year six right now. Uh, we use the Zoom platform, and we have four panelists uh, that uh, are kind of part of the clinical discussion. That includes uh, Dr. Carrie Stevens, clinical psychologist, Dr. Barb McKinney, can, clinical psychologist myself, uh, and then Dr. Rick Reese, addiction psychiatrist. What I really appreciate about uh, this group of uh, panelists that I'm able to work with is uh, they all have a little diff different areas of, and niches of practice that they have a lot of expertise in that they can share. And a lot of pro and, and not every uh, ECHO program has both the psychiatric and the psychological uh, expertise. Uh, and having uh, both of these there really provides um, uh, community providers with a very well-rounded uh, and thorough um, uh, case discussion and uh, recommendations. So what is a typical 
you know, session look like? We have our didactic from 12 to 12.50, and then we do our roll call and announcements, and then a case presentation from the for the last remaining half hour. Case recommendations are then sent out uh, the next day. Uh, the didactic and discussion, we thought, you know, lots of ECHO programs, they'll emphasize, okay, this is like a 20 to 30 minute didactic, very short and sweet. But in reality, what has happened is, is that there's lots of discussion. So we may actually, while any pre given presentation may wrap up within 30, 35 minutes, uh, there's a lot of questions that are very rich from, uh, from participants uh, to the uh, presenter uh, that uh, we just really did not want to miss out, uh, did, did not want to cut off uh, to do. Plus, as I mentioned before, the cases uh, are kind of come in as a trickle. So we may not even have a particular case that was submitted ahead of time to discuss. Um, but it, there's reasons for that in part because people bring up cases kind of spontaneously in during the kind of that dis, uh, didactic discussion. Um, as far as the curriculum, that I, we, we refresh this every academic year. Uh, we get a combination, mostly UW faculty, but sometimes there's some areas of expertise that we just don't have within our uh, within the uni our university setting, and so I'll have to go outside and find outside faculty. Uh, we've done that on topics uh, related to um, um, uh, uh, sex addiction, um, adolescent uh, OUD treatment, um, and um, um, uh, uh, su uh, support emotional support animals and some of those sorts of things. Uh, the goal of the curriculum is to is to really review the full spectrum of outpatient psychiatric and addiction treatment, mostly towards the adults. We do every once in a while have some adolescent child and adolescent topics. We have a monthly opioid related topic. Uh, this is really driven uh, by the fact that many of our providers are in rural settings where they may be the only provider uh, doing any kind of mental health treatment. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are giving them as many uh, of those current evidence-based tools uh, to address those patient needs uh, that are walking through their door. Some of the selected didactic topics include, you can see here, we've talked about everything you could think of uh, from addiction and pregnancy through co-occurring disorders, eating disorders, self-harm, OCD, uh, opioids, stimulants, cannabis, uh, Almost, uh, we try to make it uh, as very clinically practical, uh, but all, and and specific, uh, but very broad. And um, you know, over the course of five and a half years, we've been able to kind of really cover a, a number of different areas uh, that uh, is uh, that that gets into some of the real nitty gritty, uh, some of these complicated issues that providers are dealing with. As I mentioned, there's no requirements or limits on participation. It's open-ended and all providers and roles are welcome. You know, we initially thought uh, that this was really gonna be targeted to the PCPs, but as we, as I will show later, uh, we actually have providers from across the spectrum of, uh, uh, of providers that are working uh, with patients with mental health issues. So with any model um, of education and potential uh, impact on treatment outcomes, you should ask yourself, does it work? Um, and so I'm going to highlight a couple of studies uh, to showcase some of the evidence behind this model. The first and foremost, probably the seminal uh, study that really put um, the ECHO model uh, at the forefront was around the treatment of hepatitis C. So this was a prospective cohort study. Uh, they looked at um, two different areas, populations of patients. One was at the University of New Mexico and one was in the community at 21 different primary care sites that also were augmented with an ECHO training program. They looked at cure rates uh, to see, you know, how did these two sites uh, stand up as far as um, uh, getting cured of hepatitis C? And as you can see on the slide there is that they were equivocal. There was no difference uh, between the academic center and the primary care site in these rural areas. Now, this was a huge uh, outcome because in previous to this, it was very hard for anyone to find uh, community providers in rural areas to treat hepatitis C. And so it just went untreated uh, and unfortunately uh, caused lots of problems as hepatitis C does if it goes untreated. Um, and so this study showed that, hey, we can equip community providers uh, that are typically outside of being able to access a specialty center uh, to do um, some 
complicated treatment, which hepatitis C was back uh, when this study came out. Uh, it's gotten a lot better uh, these days, uh, fortunately, but back then there was, it was a lot more complicated um, uh, and which was a barrier for a lot of providers to take on. Interestingly enough, the PCP sites had lower rates of serious events. The academic center uh, did have an older cohort. Uh, um, so maybe that played a role, but regardless, um, the cure rates uh, were similar. Now, what about for mental health and uh, substance use disorders? So I'm going to highlight kind of two studies. This is probably uh, this uh, systematic review really kind of gives you a good idea of what the evidence, what the typical evidence base for ECHO programs uh, look like. Uh, and it basically looks at um, increasing uh, knowledge base and self-efficacy. And this one looked at seven studies and what they did, what they found was, yes, ECHO programs are good training uh, programs in the sense that they increase the knowledge base. This is usually based on a pre post test for some of these studies uh, and kind of self reported self efficacy. Now that's a lot. That's a few steps removed from patient outcomes. You know, are patients actually getting better in the case of OUD are providers take seeing more patients uh, because they have the, these skills and the patients that they see are they staying in treatment longer uh, than they would otherwise uh, and there are some definite question marks uh, around some of you know does uh, do echo programs eventually translate into patient outcomes now one study that does show uh, some of that uh, is a study here this is from uh, 2017 uh, this looked at uh, telementoring which this was based off the echo model uh, primary care clinicians to improve geriatric mental health care uh, they provided 33 sessions to 54 primary care and case management sites uh, over a couple of years they had some great some very supportive qualitative data and some quantitative data that I want to highlight. So on the qualitative data, people endorsed similar stuff, improved knowledge. They felt that they were providing better, had a better treatment practice and so forth. But the claims data, now this claims data uh, was from one health plan that touched beneficiaries uh, in 35 of those 54 practices, okay? Uh, and what they found is that in geriatric patients with at least one mental health disorder, ER costs went down by 24% uh, over uh, six months after participation in this program. They also found some non-significant downward trends, such as reduced inpatient admissions, outpatient visits, and reduced benzodiazepine prescriptions. Uh, they, they did mention, they did kind of track antipsychotics, although those, those did not seem to budge um, on, those, uh, claim data, on those claim data. So, uh, you know, based on that, this, you know, uh, uh, it, it is, it does provide some reassurance that, uh, that training does, is not all in vain. I mean, obviously, there's lots to be said around continuing medical, continuing education, um, and just learning what the latest evidence is, learning new practices. I mean, we all have to learn. Um, um, but it's always a question mark of taking that what we learn, and then actually translating that into patient outcomes. I think one of the high, one of the things takeaways from this particular uh, study was that this this was 33 sessions over a couple of years, and if you think about your own kind of educational uh, experience, it's really those times where you have done something over and over. You've heard those some of those uh, teaching points over and over that have really made the difference, stuck with people, and then that gets translated into clinical practice and eventually outcomes. So how is UWPAC doing? I'm going to highlight a few different areas. So participants, attendance, impact on knowledge, uptake across the state, and some qualitative data. All right, so who participates in PAC? Uh, over through year five, uh, we've had 1,258 people who have registered uh, for PAC. You can kind of see where how those numbers break down. The majority, a quarter of those people are MDs, but we have a lot of nurse practitioners. Uh, we have students, social workers, DOs, PAs, PharmDs, and so forth. Uh, and then there's a large category of other. We have a, a great cohort of SUDPs that are working in various uh, addiction treatment centers across the state. Uh, we have a great cohort of nurses that are coming, uh, masters in counseling. We've had uh, some uh, lawyers uh, are sitting in um, and, and dietitians and PsyDs. Uh, so we have, so this was, um, this, was, uh, this was honestly a little bit unexpected. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, in what's the, the common factor with all of these uh, 
uh, different specialties is they are working in with people who have mental health uh, issues. Um, and, um, you know, honestly, there was probably just a little bit of my own ignorance and uh, around, you know, what does the existing workforce look like uh, that's treating uh, mental health conditions? It's not just MDs uh, and uh, NPs. It's, it's not just the medical providers. There's lots of different people there that are all working together. And everyone is interested in kind of learning more about how to do this. And what I really appreciate uh, that all of these different uh, uh, disciplines bring is different perspectives, their different experience, uh, and it really makes for a very uh, rich kind of case discussion or just kind of discussion in general about a particular challenging topic uh, that a presentation is raised. You can see uh, the breakdown as far as what the roles were. Again, a surprising piece to me was I thought, okay, yeah, we'll have a lot of PCPs, uh, when in reality, we have more mental health providers. Um, and you know, one of the things that uh, comes up that I'm going to highlight in a couple of slides here is um, there's a lot of mental health providers that are practicing in isolation. Maybe they're in private practice or maybe they're in an area where there are just not many more mental health providers around. Uh, and PAC is, a, is, is, provi is providing a professional community for them to kind of work, uh, to learn, uh, to uh, get support uh, from, um, and to just participate. And uh, that has been a, a lot of fun to, to be a part of. All right, so how about total attendance? Uh, so this is not unique registrants. We've had uh, uh, just over 7,800 7, total people who have come into PAC sessions. <clears throat> Our total number of PAC sessions over the past uh, five years uh, have been 237. We've given almost 12,000 hours of training. Um, and then our cases presented um, have kind of slowly trickled down over the years. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly why that is. Uh, I will say that that's not an unusual thing. I've been part of a few different ECHO programs and getting cases to talk about uh, have always been a challenge. But I will say a lot of the presentation discussions that we have often are encompassing of clinical cases. You know, people will commonly say, oh yeah, you know, this, uh, you know, I have this sort of clinical scenario. Maybe it's not like a specific patient they have in mind, but it's an aggregation of, uh, of many different people that they've worked with <clears throat> and they'll bring up this question. And so a lot of clinical topics uh, do get discussed. Um, our average attendance has continued to grow over the last few years. In fact, during the pandemic, it kind of uh, jumped up in a dramatic fashion. Again, I'm not terribly surprised with that. And we've kind of been able to maintain this at around uh, 42, 44 for this year. Our um, average attend, our median attendance is around uh, 43, uh, which is, so it's pretty consistent. Now, how long do people stick around uh, with PEG? This was kind of interesting. I don't have data for year five uh, yet. Uh, but mean number of sessions attended were about five to six uh, over these years. So once people came, they would stick around uh, for about five to six sessions. Now, interestingly, I have had some people who may not show up uh, for six months, but then I see them come back uh, because there's a specific topic they're interested in, or maybe they have a case they want to discuss. We've had many people who've just kind of shown up for one. We've had some people who have shown up for mo for almost all of them, uh, as you can see. Again, we have about 47 sessions a year. Um, there are some participants in PAC that have been to more sessions uh, than I have been to, uh, to PAC sessions. Uh, and I give those people uh, a lot of credit and I appreciate their the community and their expertise that they share uh, week in and week out. It's great to see them and have them uh, participate. It's, I mean, you, you, it, there's a community that gets developed uh, where you get to know people. I've never met these people in person, uh, but it's fun to just kind of, uh, you know, check in every week. Um, honestly, I, I, I see them more than some family members, uh, to be clear. What about our didactics? In general, uh, people have uh, found them very relevant, very quali uh, and high quality. Uh, if you look at our PAC uh, website and you look at the schedule, um, our, our didactics, as I mentioned before, are very clinically oriented. So I try to make them as specific to a clinical scenario as possible. Um, so uh, last week we talked about, you know, what impact does cannabis use have on ADHD and, you know, do you treat that uh, or do you say they need to be off of cannabis? Um, this week we talked about the reluctant patient um, and we had a great role play between uh, Carrie Stevens and Rick Reese, uh, who, um, you know, kind of 
uh, presented the, our participants with a number of dis different scenarios where, uh, you know, that are very common in their clinical practice and walk through what do you say um, in these scenarios where someone may just be really kind of difficult to engage with. Um, and these are, these are, this is really the goal. We want to make our, our didactics as clinically relevant and as focused as possible. Uh, and I think that ends up getting reflected in uh, some of our ratings here. Some of our best attended um, uh, topics include things like sleep disorders uh, and the use of medications, should you use them or not. Um, uh, psychiatric symptoms in the elderly. This was a focus on a differential between frontal temporal dementia, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, mild cognitive impairment. Uh, uh, I talked about diversion in opioid treatment. You know, what does that look like? Uh, how do you uh, address it? Um, how do you kind of monitor for it? Uh, we had Dr. Fishman, uh, who was an outside provider, or who was, an, who was a, a nationally recognized provider on adolescent treatment of opioid use disorders present on year four. Uh, and then uh, we had uh, Dr. McKehor Hall uh, from California come in and talk to us about sex addiction uh, as this was kind of coming up uh, in some of the discussions. Um, and so we really, again, um, we try to again provide that uh, full spectrum uh, and some of these more esoteric topics uh, that providers are definitely face, uh, but they may, uh, you know, but maybe not to the extent of say like depression, anxiety and so forth. All right, so what about the impact? Um, uh, so if you look at, uh, this is year five assessment, uh, and this is again, assessed competency. Now we use the word competency. In reality, this is efficacy. Uh, we were not doing any kind of formal testing around this. This is a self-rating. So this is, there are some limitations there. Um, but in general, you know, when people registered uh, to people who kind of went through with us for the year, uh, overall people found that there was, they did feel more um, uh, confident that they could treat opiates, that they could treat addiction, uh, alcohol, other addictions, depression, anxiety, more severe stuff. Um, now these numbers uh, on quarter four are are very small uh, compared to the number of people who uh, rate these at registration. But this is the data we have. Um, now going along with some of that data, we get quotes like this. This is from Dr. Burns. Um, who uh, was who was kind of uh, I've worked with for a, a while, and she participated. In, she's been participating in PAC for a number of years. Uh, she described she had one of the most memorable ways that UW PAC has influenced my PAC practice has been the use of Narcan. I first learned about the product and its indications during a PAC lecture. That following week, I prescribed it to all of my high risk patients, probably ten. Last week, one of my patients relayed that he saved his life's friend with Narcan. Uh, the info that I got from PAC is hitting the streets of Spokane, Washington and saving lives. Together we make a great team. Uh, and these are these are some of the, the comments we get from people. It's very rewarding. Um, and um, it tells me that even though, you know, we may not have some of the super robust data about patient outcomes, uh, that um, people are learning in PAC as we are hoping, and it is making a difference uh, for patients they're working with. Now, how far have we been able to kind of uh, um, get to across the state of Washington? All but two counties. Uh, I feel really proud for this uh, fact. Uh, we've been, you know, we've worked hard early on. We would go to various areas uh, and actually do in-person presentations the last few years. Uh, we haven't done that, but um, uh, as you would, as you probably could have guessed, but we've still been able to kind of continue to expand our reach. Uh, and I think this is a lot of it's driven uh, based on word of mouth by other participants. Again, this is based on some of the feedback we get. Interestingly, uh, we also have people from other states uh, who have uh, uh, kind of come in for our sessions. So that includes ev everyone uh, like from Alaska to California, to Wyoming, Virginia, Tennessee, Oregon, New York, Montana, Idaho, Georgia. We've had some people from out of the country uh, drop in for a few sessions here and there. You know, they've kind of, they must have stumbled upon us uh, over uh, on, the, on the internet at some point. Um, we do kind of uh, emphasize uh, providers within the state of Washington, um, but, uh, or, or sorry, as far as for case discussions go, uh, but it's great to have some of these outside providers as well join us and hear how things are and how treatment is going in their community. So what are some of the, what, what do we kind of really consider the value added psychiatric uh, uh, access that PAC provides? One is case consultations. Um, you know, these are 
probably the most rich areas that people can learn. Uh, unfortunately, we don't we aren't able to kind of generate as many as we would like, um, but um, we do have them kind of trickle in. And one of the things that I think is a real strength is again we have both the psychology perspective and the psychiatry perspective, which I think is critical. Um, you know, meds are great. I use meds all the time, uh, but they have their limitations. Uh, psycho you know, thera therapeutic interventions is great. Uh, they have it. They have their limitations. If we can help providers to um, one think about both, think about are there therapeutic things that they could do in their visits, maybe just you know an occasional one or done sort of thing. This would be a way to do it. Uh, this is PAC. We try to do that in PAC. Uh, medical perspectives are presented. We have a number of primary care providers, uh, former uh, and former subspecialists uh, that attend PAC that are doing primary care work. And we draw on their perspectives to say, you know, okay, here, what's, is there anything we're missing uh, from a medical side of things that we should be thinking about? Um, and we, we're, and again, we're kind of doing a lot of crowdsourcing uh, within the participants who are showing up. Um, we've gotten those, some of those uh, anecdotes and quotes and feedback about how it's changing practice uh, and community building. Isolated providers uh, need community. Um, so here's an example of recommendations. Uh, this particular case was about a 30 year old uh, fellow with AUD, alcohol use disorder, obesity, depression. Um, they had been on and off again, uh, treatment with primary care. They had been on various meds, including Wellbutrin and naltrexone. They were drinking one to three days, their diabetes. Uh, they were working on diabetes management uh, issues. And they wanted, uh, the question that the provider posed to us was how to engage with someone who appears to be pre-contemplative. So we talked about engagement. Uh, we talked about uh, therapeutic. What are some things to focus on? Um, how do you coordinate? This was a mental health provider. So how do you coordinate with the PCP around their meds? Um, you know, how do you, how do you, um, you know, kind of relay some of your concerns that you're seeing that, you know, Maybe the PCP is missing, or you want to make sure the PCP doesn't miss. Uh, and then we talk about medications, of course. So we really try to kind of give, even though you know they they talk specifically about how to engage, other things come up in the in the case discussion uh, that uh, need to be addressed, and uh, we try to put a nice you know full um, uh, set of recommendations together for someone. Some of those uh, consultation ratings, so verbal feedback uh, is found to be helpful. 26% uh, agreed, strongly agreed, 70% written feedback has been found consistently helpful as well. What about practice change? Again, this is self-report, but you know, um, as of 2019, um, almost 80% uh, said that they were gonna make some of the following changes. Prescribing buprenorphine, this, was, this is huge. This is really uh, a, a great you know, um, endorsement uh, that they, you know, they were thinking about doing this more. Setting aside more time to discuss uh, sleep with patients better identifying sources of perceptual disturbance, so kind of the differential. Uh, and how do you approach patients with co-occurring disorders? You know, these are uh, very practical things that the people got from our presentations uh, that they were gonna, that they were feeling more confident about to actually then bring into their practice that their patients probably needed. Uh, a couple of um, uh, quotes that I'm gonna highlight that we've gotten from people. Uh, again, uh, just kind of relaying some of the practice change. Um, you know, one, uh, this, this is from our probably most dedicated group out in Port Angeles uh, that I really appreciate. They've been with us since the beginning, I think literally session one. Um, but one of the providers, uh, Dr. Steffens, has said, because of the dedication and work of the PAC telemedicine team, there are people alive in Claylam County that wouldn't be otherwise. PAC is an incredible resource to our free clinic in a county that has little behavioral health resources for uninsured and underinsured patients. Providers consistently talk about how they like the teaching, they like the quality product, uh, they like the full scope mindedness uh, and just that clinical applicability. Um, and getting you know, feedback like this uh, really um, helps uh, validate what we're trying to do and, and uh, reassure that we're headed in the right direction. Some other additional feedback that I want to uh, highlight with uh, highlight. You know, so the, here is a, a provider is an internist in rural Western Washington Forks. We have a shortage of mental health providers. Um, UW PAC has been invaluable uh, uh, for me to how to learn how to do this. They have been available for case presentations when I'm stumped. My patients have benefited. Another uh, uh, comment was uh, 
has uh, UW PAC has provided our rural semi rural clinical team with the ability to access psych and addiction expertise in case discussions discussions that would be otherwise unavailable in our service area. These PAC case conferences have positively reinforced our local efforts to provide evidence based treatment within harm reduction low barrier practice models. The discussion of timely and innovative practice topics helps our clinical team keep up to date. Personally, I find these discussions help further humanize not only the individuals we serve, but also the efforts of those providers who are consistently working to improve treatment and outcomes in spite of the complexities that present. All right, so can UW PAC help train up the existing workforce to improve access to mental health treatment? I think on equivocally, less, yes. I think the evidence base supports that you, that ECHO programs are an effective training um, uh, way to increase the knowledge base um, and uh, uh, feelings of, of self-confidence and efficacy around uh, with the existing workforce. Um, and, um, you know, one of the interesting things is that um, the existing workforce is broader, a uh, broader audience than I expected. Um, so, you know, not only are we, yes, we're addressed, we're getting to PCPs, we're getting to mental health providers, but we're also getting to substance use disorder professionals, we're getting to um, trainees, we're getting to social workers, we're getting to lots of other people uh, besides kind of my idea, you know, kind of the traditional uh, MD, nurse practitioner, PA uh, type of role, which is great. You know, the, you know, when it comes to treating mental health conditions, uh, it takes a team approach. I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned from collaborative care. And um, ECHO can support the, not, the, the increase in knowledge base across the spectrum of providers in any team. The other thing that um, uh, helps with the existing workforce is that mental health providers are often in isolation. I mentioned this earlier. Oftentimes, providers may not uh, have a lot of other colleagues, mental health colleagues, you know, they have PCPs, but they don't have their mental health colleagues to kind of bounce things off and PAC can uh, definitely kind of meet that need. Um, and then I, as I mentioned earlier, there's many roles and settings uh, that need more training on psych and addiction topics. Uh, you know, you think of uh, maybe that's uh, with maybe that's uh, nurses who uh, kind of are coming from, you know, maybe they spent most of their time on inpatient medicine on a surgical med unit, uh, surgical med unit, uh, or maybe it's SUDPs that hadn't had as much uh, psychiatric training. Uh, uh, PAC uh, and kind of the broad approach that we're taking uh, can help work and uh, meet some of those training needs uh, for all those providers. The supportive community has been huge. Uh, this is something that I, I did not appreciate enough, um, but uh, ECHO programs, especially ones that are longitudinal, uh, that have been occurring for years, you really do, do develop this supportive community uh, that cannot be understated. Uh, on that point, that longitudinal training uh, within that supportive community, I think, is really what can ultimately make the difference on patient outcomes. Lots of these studies uh, for ECHO programs are very short, as many studies are, maybe three months, maybe six months. Uh, the one that was two years of, of work, uh, those had outcomes, and I think that that is uh, some of the uh, what's needed uh, when it comes to educational programs um, and why uh, it's been great to have PAC going for so long. Does it pain, change patient outcomes? Anecdotally, yes. Across the population, I don't think we know, uh, uh, at least from a mental health and substance use disorder standpoint. I hope so, um, but you know, I think we'd have to be able to kind of look at some claim data uh, and see what those populations look like over time, which we just haven't done. All right, so lastly, I want to just take a couple of minutes and ask, you know, what about ECHO and collaborative care programs uh, or other forms of integrated care? My general feeling is, is that the better uh, trained your entire workforce is in mental health or substance use disorders, the better your program is going to be, the better treatment you are going to give. You know, when you look at patients for getting treatment for SUDs, there are multiple ways where a person's treatment can be derailed. Uh, that may occur when they walk into the front desk and check in. Um, you know, uh, not this is not specific towards people that work at the front desk, but you know, if there is a stigma and bias that is getting picked up from the front desk person to that person who is coming in for their SUD treatment, that will be a turnoff and that person may not come back. Maybe it happens when they get roomed with the MA. Maybe it happens with the PCP. Maybe it happens at the lab. Uh, so if they're, um, so the better of your overall team is going to be on 
addressing mental health, the better you're going to work uh, in your collaborative care program, in your behavioral consultant program, uh, in any program, uh, I think is uh, a, a key uh, feature uh, or a key takeaway about how ECHO programs and collaborative care can interact. ECHO programs uh, have been used to support implementation efforts for collaborative care. And again, as I mentioned, they have been used to train collaborative care team members. What about UW PAC and the endless opportunities of training programs in the UW system? The UW system itself has 13 other ECHO programs. Uh, so here is the list. Uh, they, there's CBT for psychosis, autism, first episode of psychosis, geriatrics, TB, telepain, HIV, hepatitis, trauma recovery, and our newest with Dr. Jen Erickson, TBI. Um, the ones with asterisks, those are run by faculty within the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Psychology. I feel very proud. Uh, I think we are really trying to do our part to uh, train the existing workforce. Um, but it's not just our program, it's everyone. So, you know, how does any provider, could they go to and do any of this stuff? Well, the fact is, is they, they don't. Uh, but there are some providers in any primary care practice or mental health practice that have an area of interest. Um, you know, or maybe, you know, they are working on just on improving their addiction treatment. Uh, and then, you know, they're going to go and check out their, get better at treating hepatitis C because treating, treating someone with for OUD often is going to involve, uh, uh, testing them for hepatitis C and then hopefully treating them for hepatitis C. And uh, there can be a lot of synergy between these programs. Uh, but not only this, there's the AIM Center has lots of education, there's ADAI, there's Northwest ATTC, Northwest MHTTC. Um, all of these uh, coexist. I think they can be, they're often very supportive. We have actually promoted some programs uh, from many of these places. Uh, in PAC, if, patient, if providers wanna kind of do a deeper dive in some of these areas. Uh, and so I think this is, um, you know, there's a lot of providers out there. There's a lot of training needs. And I think all of these uh, play a role uh, and um, uh, for trying to, again, address the uh, work, the existing workforce's uh, training needs uh, to meet the needs of the, of the patients. So I just want to take uh, the last couple of minutes here and just highlight what is our, who's our, what's our upcoming schedule in case you might be interested. Uh, so next week, Dr. Sullivan, uh, who's a pain psychiatrist here at the University of Washington, is going to be talking about the use of buprenorphine for chronic pain. This is coming up a lot more. If you are in a primary care setting, you, you may have many patients uh, that are on full agonist opioids. Uh, and Dr. Sullivan is going to kind of get into the nitty gritty a little bit on the use of buprenorphine, which is arguably a safer med. Um, and um, especially if someone has developed an opioid use disorder. Dr. Whitfield is going to be talking about pharmacogenetic testing. Uh, sometimes, uh, is this useful? Is this not? Uh, patients ask for it, and Dr. Whitfield is going to kind of talk to us about that. Dr. Peel, Dr. Barnes will be talking about Washington State mental health legal updates. This is an area that I do not know much about, um, and maybe you don't either, uh, but I find it fascinating, and, the, and it's good to know uh, what the latest, what the landscape of some of the legal implications are uh, when you're practicing in the mental health field. And then finally, we're having that we're having Jennifer Perlstein, who's gonna be talking about disabilities, identity, and access to mental health treatment. Again, you know, right now, um, you know, I, I'll, when I'm working with someone who may have a disability, say for instance, uh, who is deaf, you know, I'll click on uh, my Zoom link to invite some, uh, someone to speak, uh, do American Sign Language to the visit. But I made, there's lots of other considerations uh, that are there that I know I am not uh, recognizing. Uh, and uh, Jennifer will be getting into that. And so hopefully, if you have an interest, feel free to stop by any of these sessions um, uh, and uh, participate to the extent that you can. If you have an interest in registering, here is our website. You can just type in UW PAC, uh, and uh, this should pop up very soon on the links. And then lastly, I want to give a special thanks to the whole UW PAC team. So, of course, the panelists, uh, and then also uh, Anna Rotsliff, uh, who oversees our program uh, on uh, kind of the um, and has really helped kind of direct with some of the funding. And then also a lot of all of our uh, all of the support staff that makes this happen from Cameron Casey, Betsy Payne, Diana Roll, Randy Gray, Caratao, Esther Solano, and 
uh, Randy Gray Grant. <laughs> uh, and then a special thanks to all the faculty who have presented over the years. Um, if you have an interest uh, that you have, like say, hey, this is a clinical question that I have dealt with, that I have put together a topic, um, and you know I'd like to present at PAC. Uh, this is great for your CV. Let me know. Reach out to me. I am putting. I will be putting together the 2022-2023 PAC presentation schedule. All right. And with that, I appreciate your time. I'll wrap up and bring Joe back and see if there's any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Duncan, for, for uh, describing the PAC, the, the reach of PAC, what's, what you've measured so far, the objectives, uh, and, and what, you, what you've led here is a very interesting way of getting this, this large group of clinicians together, some, some really for the long term. Um, I want to invite uh, participants to write in any questions or comments. There was one, I think, straightforward question that came in. I think you addressed it, but just to confirm, are, are the prior presentations recorded and archived on the PAC site? Yeah, uh, so the, pre the some prior, pre all presentations are recorded. Some are available um, on Vimeo. Uh, they're arguably, they are a little bit hard to find, but if you go to Vimeo and type in ICTP PAC, you'll probably find it. Um, all of the uh, slides are available on the website uh, that you can download and um, uh, review, uh, even uh, potentially use. You know, it, you know, for for those faculty member who are on the call, um, you know, I've come across where I've been asked to do a training, and I'm like, okay, I didn't, really, I've never done a training in this before. I've either invited someone who presented on PAC on that training to do it, or I asked if I could use their slides, <laughs> and they've let me use their slides, uh, which was a huge help. Um, so that is uh, where it is. We'd really like to kind of really develop a library of uh, these video uh, presentations um, uh, to make more widely available, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. That's interesting. I'm glad I posed that question. We got a little bit of a, a glimpse of what you're thinking about for next steps. Uh, maybe uh, like a searchable video database for clinicians to answer questions. It's interesting. Exactly. Uh, now, uh, now, please, any participants, please write any questions. I guess while we're waiting for that, I'll pose a question to you, Dr. Duncan. You, you mentioned a couple times about, um, I think you phrased it as isolated clinicians need community. It's very interesting. And I, I wonder if you've explicitly said that or taught that to, to the group, or if you describe PAC in such a way, or, and I mean, have you reflected that, I mean, maybe patients living in the same areas need the same thing? Have you talked yeah. about it with participants? Yeah, you know, that that's, uh, there's kind of a couple of things there. And I think uh, those are both significant. So on the community provider side, um, this was not something we really thought about, or at least I didn't think about it very deeply at the beginning. Um, but it has come up uh, with those, the providers uh, that it, one, it's, it's been the feedback we've gotten that they've given to us kind of spontaneously, that they really appreciate meeting with us and meeting with all the other participants uh, on a weekly basis. Um, you know, I think there was one incident uh, a few months ago where one, uh, one of the providers had a patient uh, who had uh, suicided. And, um, you know, they, this person was in private practice um, and they didn't really have anyone to kind of process it with or talk about it with. And so they were able to bring it up and we talked about it in the case uh, time in the last half hour. Uh, and that was a pretty meaningful uh, time. I mean, I think um, uh, lots of people were able to provide some pretty thoughtful feedback because you know, we've, we've all kind of had some of those experiences. Um, and it was really something that uh, the provider deeply appreciated um, uh, later. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, the, again, the, the when I, I gave just a few quotes, but on many of the quotes, they would consistently talk about how they just have not they were some of the few mental health providers in the area. Um, and, um, you know, PRAC has provided kind of a, you know, a professional interdisciplinary uh, uh, group to uh, talk about these things with. Um, you know, I think it's interesting to talk about the patients. There are some uh, echo programs that are geared towards, you know, um, uh, patients in some fashion, whether that's uh, kind of an educational sort of thing. 
uh, or, uh, you know, I gave the example of kind of the job training, um, you would almost wonder, you know, it would not, uh, you know, I haven't done a full review of all the different PAC sessions out there, uh, but there are some that I know that do, that work on patients developing some self, some, you know, some, uh, some of their own skill set in various uh, ways, uh, therapeutically um, and so forth, uh, to help manage their own symptoms. And I think that that is a, um, you know, an untapped potential uh, that uh, I'm not aware of, at least in our state. Well, thank, thank you, Dr. Duncan, uh, for that response. Uh, and any others, I'd like to encourage you to, to type in questions, comments. Uh, okay, H here we go. Um, let me, yeah. You know, what, one person makes a comment about having provided consultation to primary care. Uh, uh, and do PAC clinicians uh, have access to patient records? I guess I, th I think the question is getting at um, maybe more directly, do you have sufficient information to mm. give advice, to give clinical advice? Right. You, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So um, typically uh, the clinician will, you know, go in, in, in advance, uh, type in, we have a, a form that has lots of different areas to fill some details in. Uh, it can be detailed, it, they can fill in a lot, or if they don't know that much, then they don't. Um, and it's not uncommon, I have had many clinicians who are sitting in front of their EHR as they present the patient uh, to the group. Uh, and because this is kind of a live case discussion, um, you know, we're able to, we get as much information as the clinician, as the clinician knows uh, at the time of their question. Um, so while we're not specific, specifically looking at the record, you know, we're getting a pretty good idea of the pertinence that are needed. Um, and, you know, uh, all, what's great is, is because, you know, there's lots of other providers there, you know, I may not ask about something or maybe Rick doesn't or Carrie, um, but, you know, a provider, um, you know, out in Spokane is like, oh yeah, hey, what about this? Or what about that? And, um, and so sometimes those additional questions are actually part of the recommendations. Like, hey, it, I think it'd really, it'd be great to find this piece of information out. Um, and that's uh, a, a, a very useful exercise as well. I, I think that's really interesting. It's, you, you, you are confronted with the same information that that clinician has. And if there's an unknown, that's, that's an unknown. It just right. is, and you move forward with that. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, uh, another question came in just during that. Uh, um, I'm not sure I understand. Is there PAC in EPIC? I wonder if that means does one log in through the EHR? Uh, one, one logs in, I, you, you register through the PAC website, I think is what I've understood. Yeah. Right. I don't know if this question is getting to you, like is recommendations kind of get uploaded into EPIC? Um, no, they don't. They get emailed out to the provider. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's no EHR uh, integration. Uh, like, or you couldn't submit like a question through Epic either. Uh, you have to go to a website, which we try, you know, we make it as there's, there's, an, there's a submission form where it's basically a free text box. You could just say, hey, I have this 21 year old person with, uh, who's struggling to get on uh, buprenorphine. And, and that's all we'll, that's all we, that's all we'll need. And then we'll just reserve some time and you can fill in the blanks uh, the day of. Now we have just a minute or two. Uh right here at the end. No other pending questions. Dr. Duncan, I'm wondering if you want to make any last comments on any aspect of PAC or maybe more specifically what, what you've learned from PAC attendees uh, over the six years or so? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think the things that have, that have stood out to me um, is the the scope of the workforce uh, that is interested in improving their mental health and substance use to treat, treatment skills. I had no idea, um, I, the, and I did not appreciate, um, you know, the um, uh, just, uh, you know, their their the interest that was there. Um, you know, you think like, oh, people don't, you know, you don't prescribe meds, maybe you're not interested in meds, but that's not true. They're dealing with patients that are having to take these meds every day, and they want to know more about them themselves, the how to kind of provide some counseling around that, uh, and that community. I think that's the other takeaway that I really get, um, come back to all the time is, um, 
having a community, you know, a professional community that can be supportive and you can talk to with on a regular basis uh, is, is that's part of team-based care. Uh, you know, we're not, while I'm not like at a clinical site, I, you know, I definitely kind of feel that these people I'm seeing every week um, and, and that I'm, that I have submitted cases myself, uh, uh, getting their input is hugely helpful. And um, that, uh, that kind of supportive community, I think, is essential uh, to be able to, you know, avoid burnout, uh, job satisfaction, uh, and I think also patient outcomes. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, interesting to think about the, the clin clinician outcomes as well. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Duncan, again for presenting in the in the Grand Round series for describing PAC. Thank you to the participants, and we're just at one o'clock, and we'll end Grand Rounds there for today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sermelli, and thank you, everybody.